Hi, 7th grade. Welcome to the break packet. Um, I will be going over the break packet with you in this video. I will be reading parts of the documents. Um, I don't know how many I'm going to uh, go over with you, but I do want to make sure that you take your time with the readings. Um, none of the readings that you have have questions. Those questions will be answered in the video that you're watching now. Um, that way I know if you're doing the reading and how well you are understanding the readings. Um, I mean, you will be doing the readings because you're going to be doing them with me here as well. But uh, I also want you to do the readings on your own. Uh, there are several documents that I will go over uh, because I do deeply care about uh, you learning the content, but you also being able to attack uh, a certain document, being able to understand what the document is saying, and being able to understand um, information from the document and make inferences from the document. So you're more than welcome to have your document to the side and or you can just read it with me as I go. Uh, I am going to be reading these. So you don't have any questions. So this is a document you have in your break packet. You don't have any questions here. There's one uh, here, but I crossed it out. So you're not doing any of the questions in the actual document. You're doing the questions on the video. Uh, some of them are going to be multiple choice and some of them will be short answer. I will be reading the short answer ones, especially the ones that have to do with evidence because that is a huge skill that we're working on. Uh, okay, the influence of the arch. So one thing I want you to remember about ancient Rome is that uh, they developed this uh, idea of the arch, the rounded arch. This is a, this is, I think this is the arch of Constantine. If you look at it, it's the rounded arch. It gives you an idea how, how big this is because if you compare it to the people here, okay? It's a huge arch. Uh, I think he developed it or he had it built after he won a battle. Uh, one thing I remember, I want you to remember about the arch is that it is rounded. And you might be wondering, well, what does that mean? It means it's rounded like this, see? Like a semicircle, a half circle. And you'll see that later, that does change a little bit. Um, okay. The last thing, last thing means uh, that it has, la it has lasted a long time. The lasting influence of ancient Rome is apparent in many areas of our contemporary society. Contemporary means um, that it's still around today. If you look at buildings around the world, you can still see a lot of the uh, innovations of the, of the Romans, like concrete, the arch, uh, aqueducts, right? The Romans didn't invent aqueducts, but they were one of the people that perfected it. Sophisticated or complicated uh, advanced elements of law, engineering, literature, philosophy, architecture, and arts can all be traced back to the Roman Empire. But perhaps one of the most lasting contributions, so one of the most important or not important, but one of the ones that has lasted the longest. Why is this? I need a highlighter. Uh, uh, here we go. Contributions from the Roman civilization is something we see nearly every day. The Roman arch, right? This is an arch right here. An arch is a curvature. It's a curved structure designed to support or strengthen the building. Arches are traditionally made of stone, brick, or concrete. Some modern arches are made of steel or laminated wood. The wedge-shaped blocks that form the size of the arches are called voissors. Interesting. And the top center stone called the keystone. So this is called the keystone right here. Right? The one in the middle is called the keystone. Um, it is the last block to be inserted. During construction, the arch is supported from below before the keystone is put in. The curvature of an arch may take different shapes, but it is often a rounded or pointed semicircle. So we're going to talk about an arch that looks like this. That's a Roman arch, and you'll see that later in the Middle Ages, they make an arch that looks like this. More like pointed, okay? Although the Romans revolutionized, revolutionized means they made it grand, made it, made additions to it. The arch, the structure has been around since before them, so the Romans did not invent the arch. The Assyrians, people in the Middle East, used arches to construct vaulted chambers or underground drains. However, these early arches were only suitable for small structures. 
The designs weren't sophisticated enough to support large edifices or buildings like palaces or government buildings. The Romans, however, improved the arch and made it strong enough for large scale. Widespread use. By developing an arch capable of supporting huge amounts of weight, they laid the groundwork for some of the most important advancements in architectural history. So the Romans were the ones that kind of made them big, right? Like literally like big. The arch became a vital, vital means very important, feature of bridges, gates, sewers, and aqueducts, which in turn were integral to the modernization of buildings, of cities, sorry. So if I, um, if I look up Roman aqueduct, misspelled aqueduct, here you're able to see the arches, right? You see the arches? Those rounded ones, those are those are the arches, right? And the arch allows the Romans to be able to develop these big structures. Okay. Uh, if you look at the Roman Colosseum, you're also able to see the arches. Uh, I zoom in. I know it's Wikipedia. That's the arch right there. Okay, you see that? That's the arch. So they were uh, this the art uh, this innovation allowed them to create these huge structures. <clears throat> so how did the Romans do it? With their vast knowledge of engineering and design, Roman architects developed a very strong type of concrete by mixing lime and volcanic sand. Arches made of this material could support extremely heavy weights. In most cases, the Romans didn't use mortar but instead relied on precision of their stonework to ensure the sidewalls of the anchor could withstand the pressure from the uh, keystone. After the arch, Roman architecture, conti architecture continued to evolve with improvements of the vaults. A vault is an arch overhead structure that provides a space with a ceiling or a roof. So Roman, let's go Roman vault. This is what a vault looks like. So you see how they extend uh, the arch, and then they extend this arch on the on the left side, and then they extend it. So they they have a space. These arches make up a space now. Okay. They literally make up a space. This is called a vault. That's a vault. It's pretty much a uh, an arch that is elongated. Uh, let's keep going. The vault has been around since ancient times, but it was the Romans who created a rigid, solid structure that didn't need an external buttress or support. Uh, this is a word that you'll need to know later. The word is buttress, and you'll know, and I'll tell you why. Okay, you will need to know that word. The word is buttress, and you'll know, you'll learn it in the when we talk about Gothic architecture. This advancement allowed the Romans to easily construct vaults over vast spaces to create amphitheaters and basilicas. The vault also led to the development of the cupola and the dome. Right, and just how far I, reaching the arch influence goes. So if you look at Roman dome, uh, probably get, this is the Pantheon from a side view. The dome is this big rounded thing in the middle in the, on the right hand side. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can find another one that looks like this one. So it, it's kind of like an arch that's like like a vault, but it's like chunkier. Okay, we'll get to that. That's what this is what it looks like from the top. If you look at the very top. Okay, let's keep going. Um, I'm gonna stop reading. Actually, I'm gonna continue because I love this. An arch is more supportive than a horizontal beam due to the downward pressure of an arch. The development of the arch. And the vaults were also crucial in the construction of what may be one of the most recognizable structures of the earth, the Roman Colosseum. Its vaulted arches made the ceiling much stronger than a flat ceiling. In construction, there are many benefits to using arches instead of straight beams. Arches are advantageous to horizontal beams, known as lintels, because they are, this is what the Greeks use, because they are made of small uh, blocks of bricks or stone and therefore can span wider openings. It wasn't long before cultures around the world adopted the new and improved Roman arch. 
Muslims from the Arab world modified. Right? The Muslims modified the Roman design and created pointed. So they created the pointed scallop or horseshoe arches in their magnificent palaces of mosque. These unique arches came to be em emblematic of Islamic arts and architecture. In Europe, the pointed arch, remember the pointed arch is going to be different. Arch was used for extensively in Gothic um, architecture. So later in, in the Middle Ages, you have uh, pointed arches. And you'll see how they're different. The pointed arches are look more like this. You see how they're like pointed? So the one on the left is the Roman, more like Roman, and the one on the right is uh, later in the medieval, medieval period. Okay, uh, let's keep going. Created so soaring spacious feelings of many Gothic churches by the Middle Ages, more complex arches and vault structures were introduced. Uh, okay, so I, you need to read this on your own. Okay. Um, here I'm going to be placing some questions, uh, especially about the about the documents. You have questions already about the video, about you know about the what we read, uh, but at this moment you are going to be seeing a lot of the other questions. Okay. Um, if you're confused by anything, you, you can always go back. You have this as a as a hard copy. Uh, okay, so this is Rome. If you remember, if we do a timeline, first we have Greece, then we have Rome. Then we have the Middle Ages. And then finally we have, not finally, but then we have the Renaissance. And the Renaissance is trying to recreate this period, right? And that's why we're focusing so much on classical Greece and classical Rome. Because this unit is the Renaissance. And you'll see that the people of the Renaissance, they valued the Greeks and the Romans. They saw it as a golden age. So when you see a Roman building, Roman statue, Roman writing, it's very similar to what they were doing here. They try to move away from this. It is actually the people of the, of the Renaissance that call the Middle Ages the Middle Ages. Because to them, it was between them and the Classical period. And this was this middle period that they saw as a dark period. So now let's focus a little bit on this guy. This one's a little easier. This is the Parthenon, the Parthenon, right, in Greece. If you look at the Pantheon, you'll see that the Pantheon in Rome, I don't think I have the image here. The Pantheon in Rome looks looks very similar to this right here. But it, it's only the front, right? Because as I told you in class, the Romans were heavily influenced by the Greeks. Okay, this is what it looks like today. Uh, this is what it look, might have looked like. And this is what it looks like now. Um, it's about 2,500 years old. It's pretty old. Athens is the capital of the city of Greece. The city is thousands of years old. It was once a center for powerful empire. Today, it is like many other cities. It has people, cars, roads, shops, and more. But the city also has things from ancient times. One famous ancient building in Athens is the Parthenon. It was built more than 2,500 years ago. The Parthenon is a temple. It was made to hold a giant statue of the Greek goddess Athena. The Parthenon is a beautiful structure. That's an opinion, right? It is made from white marble. It is shaped like a rectangle. So it's shaped like this. Okay. Uh, each side of the temple has rows of columns. So columns, 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 columns. Right. Uh, and the front two and the back. They are part of what makes the temple so impressive. The columns are special for, for another reason. They were designed to make the temple look perfectly straight. Usually when something is as big as as a temple's column, it is seen from far away. It looks curved. So the architects of the Parthenon made the columns lean a tiny bit. They made the columns a little bit fatter in the middle than on the ends. And they made the corner columns a little fatter than the others. All this makes the temple seem straight and balanced. Okay, so the Parthenon, amazing temple. And you'll see that it heavily influences the Romans and then when the people of the Renaissance see it, they're like, oh my God, this is amazing. And you have to understand, like, people were able to still visit these structures and they're like, this is beautiful, right? They saw the architecture of the Middle Ages and they're like, ew, Gothic, as an insult. They, they were like, barbaric, right? They're like, let's not do that. Let's do the classical period instead. 
So here is the Middle Ages. So again, we have the classical period. We have Greece and Rome. I'm going to say A. Greece and Rome is A. Then we have the Middle Ages is B. That's this bad boy right here. And then finally, we're going to have C, the Renaissance, right? The people of the Renaissance saw the, the this period as a dark period. They saw Gothic. They actually called it Gothic as an insult because they saw it as barbaric. They saw Gothic art, Gothic sculpture, Gothic um, architecture as being kind of like gross. I think Gothic architecture is like amazing. I think it's incredible. If you've seen the movie The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Notre Dame Cathedral is a Gothic church, and it is magnificent. So let's focus a little bit about. Let's focus a little on the Middle Ages because it's been several months since we did the Middle Ages, and I'm sure that some of you guys forgot already. If you knew anything about knights, castles, or Robin Hood, then you already know something about the Middle Ages in Europe. The Middle Ages may seem to be an unusual name for a historical period, especially one that lasted more than a thousand years. So the Middle Ages starts with the fall of Rome, which is 476 CE. When I say the fall of Rome, I mean Western Rome, not Eastern Rome. And the Middle Ages end around the 13 to 1400s CE. So they last approximately a thousand years. Uh, people in the Middle Ages did not know they were in the middle of anything, right? They didn't call themselves the Middle Ages. They thought they were modern just as you and I do today. In fact, the Middle Ages was not a phrase used by people who lived during that time. It is a term modern historians use today to refer to the time period between ancient and modern. It was the people of the Renaissance that called the Middle Ages as well. Life in the Middle Ages was not the same as it is now. For one thing, people who lived back then probably thought about time differently. Many people measured time by the rising and setting of the sun and the passing of the seasons. For this reason, life, like a, li life likely had a slower, steadier pace. So here's an image of a Gothic church. Very different than a classical Greek or Roman church, right? And we are going to be studying Gothic cathedrals later in the, in the year when we compare and contrast. In addition, there was a strong desire to honor God. This is going to be huge. The church is the most powerful institution in medieval Europe. The church is the center of life in medieval Europe. So architecture, art, sculpture, literature is controlled uh, by the church. And that is going to impact what kind of art you're doing, what kind of architecture you're doing, what kind of literature you're, you're writing, right? Uh, in the classical period, it wasn't, right? The, the Christian church didn't exist. And you'll see that in the Renaissance, the church is still very, very powerful. But people also begin to focus on other things as well, especially the classics, the classical period, right? It, it's, I want you to remember that the Renaissance religion is still really, 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 really important. But people also begin to focus on other things as well. But in the Middle Ages, the church is the big boss. Uh, in addition, there was a strong desire to honor God uh, that appeared to transcend time. As a result, people understood impressive long-term projects such as building magnificent cathedrals that took centuries to complete. Language and location helped save, shape people's lives too. Because travel was so difficult, many people didn't do it. Generally, only rich, educated people in Europe traveled. Almost everyone else stayed close to home. Although Latin was the language of both the church and the government, only selected members of society could understand the language. Uh, Latin becomes a dead language. Most people are speaking Spanish, English, French, German, Italian, right? But most uh, books that are, are written by hand are in Latin. Um, so so uh, being able to read is very limited to, to a very small group of people. Most people live in isolated existence. They do not travel from far from home. As a result, most people communicate using the language or dialect spoken in the place of their birth. As strange as it may seem to us, in certain parts of Euro parts of Europe, Europe, villagers from places just 30 miles could, apart could not easily understand each other. For this reason, most people during the Middle Ages were concerned with the affairs of their village, what they own, what they owe the local lord in a way in the way of payment and how to ensure their place in heaven. 
uh, if you remember in the Middle Ages, we have the system of feudalism, right? Uh, and people are uh, attached to the to the manor, to the feudal system. There was another force that had a huge, huge impact on Western Europe society during the Middle Ages. This force came in the form of a deadly disease, if you remember the plague. The disease called the Black Death or Plague certainly made its mark upon medieval Europe. This dreadful plague first appeared in the 500s, in the second half of the 1300s it swept through Europe once again. Spread by infected fleas that live on rodents, the Black Death probably killed one third of the population in Western Europe. One thing that I want you to remember about the plague was that it allowed people that survive to demand higher wages. It allowed people to survive to move away from the manor and move to the cities to demand better labor, uh, better working conditions. Um, slowly, the feudal system disappeared as a result of the plague because all the farmers died. And in order for the feudal system to continue, you need farm work workers. Despite conflicts and hardship, this period in history was also a time when people created impressive and inspiring architecture. Great castles and churches began to adorn the landscape. Kings and queens and noblemen held joust and court gestures entertained noble families. So the Middle Ages, as much as the people of the Renaissance want to get rid of it or, or disregard it, it's impossible for them to do so uh, because it does impact the Renaissance. Um, Right? It's kind of like if I say I want to forget about my parents because they were not a good influence on me. Well, that's that's great and all, but they raised me. I'm going to be impacted by them. Right. Um, OK, so we did the Middle Ages. Let's go back a little bit to the to the classical period. This is the great thinkers of the classical period of, of Greece. Now, for this one, I again, I want you to remember that this is what the people of the Renaissance value. They value logic. They value people thinking. They value uh, secularism, not ideas that are non-religious. Uh, and these guys are some of the biggest thinkers in, in history, really. Okay. Philosophy is a study about life, knowledge, truth, and the mind. The word comes from the ancient Greeks. Philos means loving, and Sophie, Sophia means wisdom. So Sophia, your name means wisdom. Ancient Greece had many philosophers. Some of the most well-known philosophers are Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. So Socrates was the teacher of Plato, and Plato was the teacher of Aristotle, and Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander the Great. Socrates is often viewed as the founder of Western philosophy. He was distinguished. He was a, he was a distinguished soldier, but is most famous as a philosopher. Socrates would often ask qu people questions about a problem. Based on their answer, he would ask more questions. He usually wouldn't say his own opinion. Instead, he will keep asking questions to test their answers and ideas. After many questions and tests, the people would eventually come to a conclusion. Uh, the way of testing ideas through question is known as the Socratic method. Plato was a student of Socrates who founded the academy. Uh, the, uh, Aristotle was asked to kill himself um, or to leave Athens because he was seen as poisoning the minds of his of the youth. Um, he was asking people to question certain things, and in government, that's not always appreciated. Plato was a student of Socrates who founded the academy, a school of philosophy where he delivered lectures to students from all over Greece. In addition to teaching and exploring ideas, Plato wrote down a lot of his ideas. Some of his writings have survived for to today. Probably his most famous writings is The Republic. One idea exploring the Republic is about a fair and just government ruled by rulers who are also philosophers. Aristotle was a student of Plato in the academy. Later, Aristotle rented space in the Lyceum, a former wrestling school outside of Athens. At the Lyceum, I think that's what you say, he created a place of learning, much like Plato. He developed a curriculum centered on his own teachings. Aristotle also wrote down much of his ideas. It is believed that he wrote about 200 works. Most of them were probably written while he was teaching at the Lyceum. In his works, Aristotle explored the nature of animals, planets, planets ethics, p politics, and life. Only 31 of his works survived. So this guy is more of a... Uh, he's more of a scientist, Aristotle is. He's more of a scientist. Now, here you're going to have um, a couple questions. You're going to have a reading. And this is to, to help you develop... Uh, 
to help you develop questions or the, to help you develop uh, strategies for attacking the prompt and also close readings. So this reading has nothing to do with Greece or Rome or the Middle Ages or the Renaissance. By the way, I strongly suggest that during the break, if you have time, learn as much as you can about the classical period, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. There's a, a ton of information that is out there and I, I wish I can cover more, but we just don't have enough time. If I can teach the Renaissance for the whole year, I would, and maybe I will next year, I don't know. Um, it's an incredible time period and there's so many people that you should like start thinking about Da Vinci, Michelangelo, uh, Shakespeare, uh, who's another one, Johann Gutenberg, uh, Bruno Leschi is a, a huge one. Bruno Leschi is massive. The Medici family, uh, the popes in Rome, um, and then and then a lot of the works: Sistine Chapel, the Mona Lisa, the Pieta, the David, uh, Santa Maria del Fiore's Dome. There's a ton of of information, and I'm going to try to cover as much as possible. But I, I want you to like push yourself to like think about that yourself. So this uh, this is called. All about the Klondike gold mines. So I'm going to have you guys, I might read this with you. I won't read this one, Plastic is Poisoning Coral Reef. And then there's another one, False Stories Travel Faster Than the Truth. You are going to have questions on on these three texts. Um, I'll read this one with you, and then you have some short answers. I think this one pops up in the, in the, in the video, in the question. Uh, I think both of those. I'm not sure. I think both of those pop up. Uh, for this one, same thing. Okay. So let's do this one together and then we'll call it a day. So this is a trap. Someone traveling to the Klondike gold mines. The man who wants the Yukon gold should know where he's going to tackle, to tackle before he starts. Let me read that again. The man who wants the Yukon gold should know what he is going to tackle before he starts. If there's an easy part of the trip... I haven't, I haven't struck it yet. So apparently going on this trip is really hard. Uh, okay, here we go. Eight of us made the trip from June, Junea, Junea, I guess it's the place, to Daya. A hundred miles on the little steam launch alert. The steamer, Mexico, the steamer called Mexico reached Danea the same morning with 423 men. As she drew so much water, she had to stay about three miles offshore and land her passengers and freight as best as she might in more or less inaccessible places. Inaccessible means that it's really hard to get into it. On the rocky shores. Then up came the 22-foot tide, and my poor fellow saw their entire outfit swept into the sea. We camped the first night. So this person sounds like he is, uh, it's like a journal entry. And he's talking about this time he traveled to this place uh, called the Klondike. For, for gold. We camped the first night in Daya. It is, it is a most enjoyable thing. This making camp in the snow. I don't know if he's being sarcastic. First you must shovel down to three, three to six feet to find a solid crust. So he's being sarcastic. So you have to shovel the snow out. Then you must go out in the snow up to your neck to find branches with which to make a bed. And then comes the hunt for a dead tree. The hunt, sorry. For a dead tree for firewood. Dinner is cooked in a small sheet iron stove. So he's being sarcastic. It's most just obviously not enjoyable. Always keep an eye on the grub. Grub is food, especially the bacon. For the dogs are like so many ravenous wolves. And it is not considered just the proper thing to be left without anything to eat in the frostbitten land. At night, it is necessary to tie up the sacks of bacon in the trees or build trestles for them. But to, to, the, but to, the, but to the trip, he's going to talk about the trip now. The second day, this is an interesting text. The second day, we went up Daya Canyon. It is only three miles long, but seems fully 30. I wonder why he says that. It's only three, but it seems like it's 30 miles. This is true of all distance in this country, in this area. About 100 pounds is about all a man wants to pull in this cannon. As the way is steep 
and the ice slippery. So camp must be made short distances apart. So they have to make camp, but they can't walk a lot because they get tired. As you have to go over the trail several times and bringing up your outfits. Remember, an ordinary wa outfit weighs from 500 to 800 pounds, and some of them much more. So what he's saying is that from one camp to the next, they have to make several trips because you are you have about five, five to 800 pounds worth. Now, if you were like a big gorilla, you could probably carry all that. Even then, you probably still couldn't carry it. Uh, it's really, really heavy. But the summit of Chilkoot Pass, that's the place that puts the yellow fear into many man's hearts. So this place sounds like it's a dangerous place. Some took one last, some took one look at it, sold their outfit for what they would bring and turn back. So some people got to this canyon or this pass and they're like, oh, nope, going back. So they, that's what he says, sold their outfit for what they could bring and turn back. The pass is over the ridge, which skirts and coast the coast. It is only about 1,200 feet from base to tip, but it is almost straight up and down, a sheer steep of snow and ice. There's a blizzard blowing there most of the time, and when it's at its height, no man may cross. For days at a time, the summit is impassable. An enterprising man named Burns had, has ridged a windlass and cable there, and with his and with it, he hoist up some freight at a cent a pound. So if you want to, if you want to do 100 pounds, you have to pay a dollar. So trestles, a framework, horizontal and vertical bars used to raise something off the ground. A windlass, a machine used for hoisting and hauling. So these questions are going to appear. Uh, just give you the heads up. Uh, this one's about coral reef. I'll let you guys read this one. It's pretty low lexile uh, and it's not that long. Uh, it has to do with coral reef. And then this one is also 750 Lexile. False stories travel faster than the truth. Uh, and then that's that's all I have. Um, I am, I, I really want you guys to do well. Uh, again, try to learn as much as you can about the Renaissance. Because when you come back from the break, we're going to be focusing on the Middle Ages and then really really diving into the renaissance when you come back we're also going to continue working on your skills uh and the skills document is very similar to this we're going to devote half the class for the skills and half the class for the renaissance sometimes we'll combine them if we can but um yeah have a great break and email me if you have any questions Bye bye